It's always so surprising to be in here during the daylight. It's so bright in this room. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. I feel so much better now. I'm Davy Niddle, PhD candidate in English at Penn. I'm so pleased to welcome you to the Kelly Writers House for this afternoon's reading with Joshua Whitehead. Before we begin, I wanted to thank Lauren Grishow Shade, social work intern at the LGBT Center, and Aaron Cross, director at Penn's LGBT Center for their work in organizing this event. And Lauren's gonna say a few words about the larger picture of what's happening over the next couple of days. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I am from the LGBT Center. I'm the social work intern, as Davey mentioned. Uh, this is part of the larger project to bring the Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Symposium on Social Change into more of a contextual light in thinking about social change with indigeneity, specifically as we talk about what's happening on Penn's campus and also more globally um, throughout the world. So this was a really important event for us to put on. It's a two-day residency featuring both Joshua Whitehead and Demian Deneyasi. And they're going into classrooms. They're talking with folks um, on like a smaller interpersonal scale. But they're also holding events like this with Kelly Writer's House. They'll be meeting with some deans later on to talk about uh, strategies for changing schools and systems within schools. And then it will end with a culmination event at the law center, uh, the law, not the law center, the law school. Um, at the Levy Conference Room at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. And that will be a conversation that's moderated by Talina Aguayo, who is the director of We Are the Seeds of Culture Trust Philadelphia. Um, if anyone has any additional questions about what the residency looks like or what the schedule is, the full itinerary is on the LGBT Center's website. And if you have any specific questions, you can always direct them at me, Lauren, L-O-R-A-N, at upenn.edu. Thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to this. Lauren's done an amazing amount of work. Can we thank them? Yeah. Thanks. So uh, in addition to the ama amazing amount of work that Lauren's done to put this event together, this reading and conversation uh, organized by the LGBT Center is co-sponsored by the LGBT Center, the School of Social Policy and Practice, Annenberg, the Alice Paul Center, the Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies Program, the Penn Women's Center, the Penn Museum, the Department of English, Greenfield Intercultural Center, the Graduate School of Education, the Sachs Program for Arts Innovation, and Penn Dental. And as a person who also organizes events on campus, I can picture the number of emails that was to send, uh, which is truly impressive work. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I also want to make sure, as many of you know, that lunch is available in the other room. Uh, please visit it whenever you'd like. There are all gender restrooms at the back of the first floor through the kitchen and at the top of the stairs. Joshua will read for about 25 minutes. Then we'll have another 20 or 25 minutes for Q&A and aim to wrap up right around one. There are books for sale in the other room and Joshua would be willing to sign a book after the reading. In a 2018 interview, Joshua Whitehead describes his 2017 poetry collection, Full Metal Indigiqueer, as a framework for disrupting a white Western literary canon. He explains, I decided to take this big mess of canon text and go, let me craft a virus so I can infect, invade, and indigenize, so we can see ourselves in this canon, that high class American, British, Canadian. Let me infect them with these indigenous characters while using queer two-spirit indigenous folks. In the poems in Full Metal Indigiqueer, Whitehead focalizes an indigenous and two-spirit present and future. In the poem, Sleigh Bells Reign in Suburbia, he writes, I am the ghost of natives past, the ghost of colonialism present, the ghost of settlers to come. In Whitehead's poems, part of the act of refusing and remaking a Western literary canon and the colonial histories in which it is embedded is centering indigenous queer and two-spirit sex and sexuality. Both the poems and Whitehead's 2018 novel, Johnny Appleseed, detail sex as simultaneously a social form on which histories, presents, and futures of colonialism are written, a catalyst for somatic memory, and a source of embodied joy. In the poem, Can You Be My Full-Time Daddy, White and Gold, question mark, he writes, I was in the winter of my life. The men I met along the road were my only summer. And in Johnny Appleseed, Johnny, the novel's protagonist, notes, sex has always had a magic, an ability to waken things in me that have died. Between their descriptions of sex, internet culture, readership, and indigeneity, the poems and the novel both raise questions about what it means to form kinship over time, 
often in contexts where some forms of belonging are possible, even as others are foreclosed, in kinship with biological family, with sexual partners, with chosen community, with a non-human world, and with texts, a kinship formed by reading. Later in Can You Be My Full-Time Daddy, Whitehead asks, how did Williams, Whitman, and Ginsburg see themselves as beautiful things? In I Can Be a Dream Girl Too, he writes, why am I always adapting your words from Latin tongues and French theorists? I've mastered my master's language. I'll need a tic-tac after this poem. Uh, separate from my introduction, Joshua's writing is also hilarious. It has a wonderful sense of humor. The final pages of Full Metal Indigiqueer include a list of sources. Among them, a record of reading and watching and listening to trans-Canadian author Casey Plett, indigenous American author Sherman Alexi, RuPaul's Drag Race, an early modern English canon John Donne, William Shakespeare, American queer theory Leo Bersani, late 20th century science fiction novels and film, Videodrome, Neuromancer, Anglophone pop music roughly from the 70s to the present, Grace Jones, Rihanna, CBC News reports in Canadian history, and a significant number of texts that exceed this list. I uh, imagined, as I was uh, thinking toward talking about Joshua's work, a syllabus produced solely from those texts and how exciting that would be. As the source list suggests, Whitehead's writing offers an exchange between readers, an encouragement to read and watch and listen to the work of many people thinking about systems of power from many places and embodied experiences, and with adjacent or divergent strategies for survival and overlapping and conflicting visions of the future, to consider how each text might differently populate an imagined future in the name of solidarity. Whitehead's writing reinforces that one thing you can do if you are interested in solidarity is to structure the time available to you to read as a lived practice of listening and as one of solidarity's primary modes. Joshua Whitehead is an Oji Nehio Two-Spirit member of Peguis First Nation Treaty One. He is the author of Full Metal Indigiqueer and Johnny Appleseed. Currently, he is AB an ABD doctoral student at the University of Calgary, Treaty 7, where he focuses on indigenous literatures and cultures with a specialization in gender and sexuality. His forthcoming book, Making Love with the Land, is a creative nonfiction manuscript that details indigeneity, queerness, and mental health, and is slated to release in 2021 with Canop Canada. It is my great pleasure to welcome him to the Kelly Writers House. What an intro. I feel like you should blurb my next book. <laughs> Um, Tanse folks, hi my friends. Thanks for coming out today and sharing your lunch with me. Uh, after that intro, I changed a section I'll be reading for something a little sexier. Um, but I'm going to begin with this. So um, this is just a, a vignette from the novel itself uh, where Johnny is kind of mourning for or longing for his mother and the space of Winnipeg as well. I drew myself a bath. The tub, the grungy yellow of cigarette-stained fingers, hairs clinging to its sides in perimeter. As I sat down in it, I thought of the Red River that gushed blood and guts and catfish just a few blocks away. I wondered how cold the rapids in Peguis were right now, those fat leeches waiting for a fish to suckle off. Here, my penis wriggling in the bath, I too am cheap tackle. Those frothy waters full of lucky cans and severed hands and oak leaves that clogged our drain pipes. Water was a mentor to me, a playmate. Water was a feral child. I used to sit on the bank of the rapids, feet dangling in the stream. If I stayed still long enough, the crawfish would climb over them, inspect the grooves between my toes. What would life be like if I were a crawfish? A little pest that ages too fast, only three months, and then they're plunged into the cruel world of adulthood. To be a crawfish is to be in constant fear of your own self. To be ripped apart by kin who pierce your soft spots with teeth and claws that shred you from the inside out. To be a crawfish, I thought, is the best primer sur for survival. If you can make it as a crawfish, you can make it as anything. I plucked crawfish from my toes, let the water have it, let it fumble, scramble, try to live. The rapids are an apocalyptic Mad Max landscape. 
I watched it catch its groove, then tumble into the ducks and disappear. Who knows where I would end up? I hoped it would continue leaving, living, even if only for one more day, but who really knows these things? The water is a furious road, and the only words we can say to one another are simple. Witness me. The water in Winnipeg was just as feral as the rapids on my res. The only difference was that this river ate children, not crawfish. My cookum told me that Manitoba was a name taken from the Cree, Manitoapau, which meant something like the straight S-T-R-A-I-T of the spirit. She said it was the sound of the drum, of water beating the rocks in a constant thrum, noise like a round dance where the water would ask you to sing alongside it. The river is a space of convergence where streams and currents intersect briefly, an orgy of kissing streams, a hub of sex and slapping fins. The water is the color of rust, a kind of rust that becomes a sequin when a raindrop hovers over it. When I look out over the red, I see the straight, S-T-R-A-I-T, but I wonder just what in the hell a spirit is doing out there. How many Manitou? Was mine out there too? Why would the water want to straighten my spirit? Ain't that why I got to? The elders used to tell us to humble ourselves to the water. I heard them in the speeches of Immortan Joe, do not become addicted to water. But water was always a shameful thing for us. To piss, to sweat, to spit, ejaculate, to bleed, to cry. How in the hell do we humble ourselves to water when we're so damn humiliated by it? Life ain't always as easy as an old story that never changes, you know. And we weren't always so embarrassed of ourselves as water. We were basins of thought, too. Bathing was a tumultuous experience when I was a kid. My mom would run me a bath, but the water would be the temperature of the lava on Dante's peak. I would feel like old Granny Ruth paddling through acidic volcanic liquid in my mother's bathwater, my legs turning pink and tingling, the heat stinging my nose, all the while my mother reassuring me, boy, it's not even hot. Then she would climb in, her tummy and breasts falling loose in the water, her stretch marks like footprints on her belly and hips. She'd nestle me in between her legs and ease us both back into it, the hot water cradling us, covering my chest, opening up my lungs, my exhales a steady stream of dirt and mucus and phlegm that purged themselves from my body. And her hair... Her long brown hair snaked around the tub, wrapping itself around my arms, making me look like I too had the length of a horse's tail. My mother would wash us both with L'Oreal Kid Shampoo, the watermelon kind, a green bottle with a pink lid and an eye peeking out at us from the label. It was the shampoo that never burned my eyes. Mama assured me of that. And while we lathered up our hair, I built myself a pair of breasts, just like my mother's, using the soap from my head. Mama, you think I'm pretty? I'd ask, and she'd reply, My boy, ain't no one ever looked better. We'd cuddle in the tub until the water turned cold and opaque, until our nipples turned to points and our fingers pruned like cookums. My mother would get out first and I'd remain in the water, gurgling it in my mouth, the taste of soap, dirt, skin, sweat. I drank it in small sips until my belly felt hard as a rock. I liked to put my head beneath the water, listen to time slowing down, the sound of my blood pulsing in my head, the distorted voices of my stepfather Roger and Mum arguing downstairs, the enhanced sound of their footsteps which made their own music gave their own cues. In the water, I was beautiful. 
My boy body was genderless in the tub. My penis too shriveled to really look like anything but the nether regions of a Barbie doll. My nipples shielded by a face cloth covering a shame that would never be mine. The water never set me straight. The water leaked with me down the drain. Here, in my own bathtub alone, I think of Mama. I think of those rapids. I think of how they split rocks and dissolve them into sand. I think of how water crafted this whole damn planet, carved it into animals. I think of home. Just why in the hell did I ever decide to leave? Cookum's gone, and Mama's got the sickness of loneliness, the kind that'll turn your liver into coal. Leaving made me feel as if I'd split myself. This throb, a residue of pride, having left. For the life of me, all I wanted now was this. To regress, to crawl backwards into time, into a womb that smells of earthworms and eggshells, for my knowledge of the world and its pains to be a second thought, for my idea of home being bound by only four walls on the res. All I wanted was to shift back up inside my mother in the bathwater of her uterus, to count time as a crawfish would, for days to mean something other than another notch on the wall another treaty dollar earned i wanted that i wanted all of that how easy how warm how outlandishly impossible i thought just how in the hell are we supposed to live in a world that ages us like crawfish i washed my hair with head and shoulders killed the bugs that were making a life on my scalp i felt myself in the tub my blood stiffened to a point, made my own throbbing drum beat, my own manatoa pow, my own round dance being the huff of break you make, the huff of breath you make when the nerves on your cock tingle like pop rocks. I came into the bathwater, let the residues swim, and eventually drown in the tub. If you come back, I said, don't you ever come back as an Indian, you hear? Um, I'm going to share another excerpt from the end. Uh, so Johnny is an online sex worker, primarily, and kind of self-fetishizes himself in order to make a living. And the whole plot of this, this novel is basically, in short, him earning enough money through online sex work to return home to his res for the wake of his stepfather, Roger. Um... But it's not really about that. I think that people call this a novel. I'm like, I kind of read it as like a photo album. It's mostly just Johnny telling you his stories. Uh, so the plot is kind of the straightforward thing, but time and memories, they kind of loop backwards and forwards. Uh, very much an oratory, like I think we would all, like you would hear around a dinner table. So this is when Johnny's back on the res, um, and he's reminiscing about a hookup. I had this one client... Tomas202, a native twink with an overbite whose teeth looked like shovels. He said he found my name in the bathroom stall in Pegwas Central. We chatted for a month before he started asking for shows. He never asked me to dress up, just asked me to talk to him, then take off my clothes slowly, and while I did, to describe my body like it was a portrait painting. This nipple here... This is the one that's extra sensitive, I tease. And if you kiss me here on the bits of my thigh that look like Kentucky Fried, well, you'll just have to find out. He was bashful, fidgety, inflamed, but coy. He wore a bandana to conceal his face, and he kept his hair pulled back in two braids that were hidden by a baseball cap. Took me a while to get him to take that bandana off. You ain't gotta hide yourself like it's a graveyard, my boy. There were too few occasions where I could bedazzle boys with that euphemism, my boy. I knew it coaxed natives like the bad magic my cookum used to tell me about. We corresponded in short bursts for some time. He asked me questions like I was a goddamn psychiatrist, and I kept responding long enough to hear that little ka noise of more money going into my account. What's it like, he typed in the chat box. It's what like, I responded into the mic. Sex, he typed. It hurt. Nah, I paused. That ain't that bad. Question mark, question mark. 
It don't hurt as much as the rest does, I wanted to say, but I closed the chat prematurely. After about a month of little chats and strip shows, we ended up finally meeting. He said he could host as his roommates were out shopping in the city for the weekend. When I got to his place, he was only wearing boxers and a ratty wife beater and wasted no time dragging me to his bedroom. He shimmied out of his shorts and pulled his shirt up over his chest, and I swear I damn near saw every organ in his body. He was that skinny. I took off my clothes too, and then we laid on his bed facing each other, inspecting one another's body. We jerked each other off until we got hard. Then he climbed on top of me and kneaded his junk against me. He rubbed so damn hard against me that I wondered if he thought our bodies were kindling. Slow, I said. Hold on to me tighter, but be patient, like you're fishing or something. He nodded and started to kiss me. His teeth dug into my lip like it was a flower bed. He kept forgetting to let us breathe, so I had to take in large puffs of air whenever I had the chance. I slid his hands over my hips, down to where I needed loving, but he shook his head and lay back down on top of the bed. Can... Can you top me, he asked. I was taken aback. No one had ever asked me that before, but his face was so goddamn woebegone that I nodded yes. I slid myself between his legs, ran my fingers down his back. When I circled my finger around him, he gasped, and when I slowly slid inside, he squirmed like a fish on bait. He jolted, and I jumped, surprised at how much I could do, but he kept nodding and said, keep going, and we worked around one another like that for a while, his eyes growing large at the little world opening for him down there, and me scared of how much power he was granting me. And when I finally entered him, his whole body shook. He wrapped his legs around me like a basket. I thought, this is it? All of this, the power of man? It took the entirety of two minutes for me to spill myself over him. Two minutes of prayer to Manitou that I didn't slip out and fuck up. He finished himself off, a hot, sweaty mess, but his body was brown like mine in all the right spots. That was, that was, it was, I said. We cleaned ourselves up with a tube sock and then sat up in the bed, both of us staring out the window. The night was thick and we could hear frogs croaking out of sync with one another. You want to smoke, I asked, and he nodded, probably thinking it was the thing to do after sex, ain't it? I got up and got my smokes with the intention of stepping outside. Hold on, he said. We should put something on. Some someone will see us. I, for fuck's sakes, ain't no one out there. It's dark as shit. Come on. I opened the door and we stepped outside naked, the wind splashing against our skin, pushing testicles back up inside ourselves. I lit us both a smoke and passed him one. I inhaled as deep as I could, tried to burn out that authority wherever it lay deep down in me. He inhaled and coughed, trying to smoke the cigarette like a joint. I rolled my eyes. Slow, I said again. You ain't always gotta be rushing everything, my boy. And there that phrase was again, my boy, knocking against my gut like a sledgehammer. He took a deep puff and let it out. There, I thought. Now you're getting it. The smoke slithered up into the night sky. Do you think I'm sexy? He asked. I think, and paused to take a drag. I think you're beautiful for a boy who lets himself feel. I didn't have the heart to tell him everything. Didn't have the courage to say, man, feeling like that's going to break you if you ain't careful. It's just, it's my first time, you know, he said, as if I didn't already know. I hope I didn't do anything wrong. Did I make any mistakes? Mistakes? I tried hard not to laugh. Well, let's see. Your first mistake was asking me that. Then I put my hands on his shoulders and pressed my forehead against his. And your second one was ever thinking you owed me a goddamn thing. He nodded, took another drag. I feel you, he said. We went back inside and got dressed. His walk was now a hearty swagger. <laughs> you staying over, he asked. Nah, man, I gotta go, but this was fun. Yeah, bro, it really was. <laughs> <laughs>
We'll have to do it again sometime. Yeah, maybe. He looked disappointed. He walked me to the door, then gave me a kiss that was more of an attempt at swallowing me whole than a light peck goodbye. As I opened the door to leave, he grabbed my arm. Hey, you got any advice for someone like me, he asked. Advice? I paused for a minute, unable to believe any sad sucker wanted advice from me, the self-ordained Indian princess. Um, yeah, how about this? We all got thick skin, but we still gotta let people in. I turned to leave, not wanting to see what his response was, because if I did, I knew I'd only see myself looking back at me. Hell, I was never good at tasting my own medicine. I walked home thinking of him and our strange date. For a minute, just a minute, I was convinced his was a body I could love. But I fit into him in all the wrong places. Advice? What kind of bullshit was that? Hell, you want some advice, boy? Here's some straight from me to you. Use those teeth. Use them to dig yourself out of every single ass you ever eat. <laughs> <laughs> tasty, tasty. And I'm just going to read a short excerpt from my new work. Um, so this is from the forthcoming manuscript. Um, and it's called Who Names the Res Dog Res? I'm reading Ocean Vong's On Earth Were Briefly Gorgeous, and I let the words find me because the body always knows better than the mind does. Muscles remember, they witness like trees, riddles etch disease, and I am weeping willow, crying seeds and dripping saline from my hair. This is how I got my name, you know. Or how the tree's cambium will warp a bullet civilly, make room for the wound in the structure of their being, crown themselves with flora, and I am now singing starling. Ocean Vong asks us, who will be lost in the story we tell ourselves? Who will be lost in ourselves? A story, after all, is a kind of swallowing. Feel the roots of me, an ecosystem of pain. I am anthropic in the desert of my being. Do you feel how much the winds have dried my tendrils? Feed me, water me, nurture me. I would be lying if I didn't say I too want to swallow you in this story I call essay. Essay I call livelihood. Life I pretend to call my own. I dog ear ocean's page and make an animal of story. I am looking for a wilderness in the act of being wild. I hear a res dog. I haven't seen you in a dog's age, dog's age, by which I mean I haven't seen myself in years. I'm sitting on the hills of Dover, a space, this is in Calgary, a space I rely too heavily on these days, the afternoon sun licking my shoulders, masseuse to the marks that stretch from the child me who still fits inside and I have only just begun to find him again, that wild ancestral dream. People walk by me, staring. There I sit alone, barefoot, feet stroking prairie grass and thistles, pricks not knowing the width of my souls. I cannot be harmed in this moment, by which I mean I cannot afford to be. Puff a cigarette. I curtail the smoke around the width of my neck, which remembers the lace of fingers around it, a finger trap, a gag toy. I let the smoke burn away the oils of your pads, which seep down into me. I listen to Maggie Rogers back in my body on repeat, tilting my cheeks to the sun, let P. Sim kiss them into roses, and I am blooming flower, you a shrike to my stamens. I hold myself as if I were a babe, bare legs with thin hairs wrapped up into my chest, I now a papoose. In regard to those who stop and gawk at a lone Indian sitting in the long grass, the other you of this story texts me, they're just stunned by your beauty in the sun. I tell them that if they are, it's entirely for me today. I am majesty in my body, living cornucopia. I eat my own seeds, which isn't to say I consume myself for once, but rather that I wilt my pain into nutrient and I am ouroboric. 
I am a body not needing to be owned. I am old, and no man can consume, let alone hold my plurality in this zipper I call a body. Or maybe I mean to say, here, in this field, hair a zephyr of rays, I become a tim, dog, relinquished from the prison house of the now, and I bark horror back into the dog house when I rest among the multitudes. I'm a res dog in this moment, a vicious sight. I read reports about res dogs, of how ammonia or settlers come to steal them, beef jerky in hand, lure them into a car, and drive off to transplant them into suburbia. I think of my three sisters have been, who have been thrown into a pot of soup. I am looking for them. Have you eaten? I imagine those regs dogs strapped in the back seat of a Volvo watching the horizon recede and their found family howling into the night screaming, Where are you? In this vignette, I am the res dog, and you are the driver. It's a hot July evening during the Calgary stampede. The window panes sweat and my tongue is panting for moisture. My skin aches to be touched, but like a frog's, it weeps when you lay a hand upon it. You grab me by the leash you have locked around my neck, force me close, my whiskers receding from rank breath, your tongue the scent of fermentation, and I my own muzzle. You promise me companionship, and I bow to your feigned generosity, if only because the skyline is a dark ring and Tipskow P. Sim or Moon cannot see me here. Already, I am strategizing survivability amongst the looming abandoned buildings like specters in the peripheries of my vision because I am trained to stare at you. Hand tightened around my collar, you bring yourself into me with the force of a bookbinder. Even this assemblage of sound drips with violence, and I am wet with ink. When you are done, you promise me a home in its largest connotations, and I resemble done as doom, home being a torture chamber, a cage, kennel, the terrible weight of pounds. Your body expunged, you smile a gluttonous grin, and I paw the door of your vehicle, escape into the night. I am feral in this delight, having returned from the throes of entrapment and survived, fleeing into the safety of a transformed me. I enter the vomitorium of who I am and hack up severance, lick the salty rue clean to chew the bone of you. I howl for my kin who rush to my side. Here, don't underestimate me, Windigo. I have chewed larger men than you into dust, blew through monuments, pissed on flagships, and you are only six inches of a man pretending he is ten. Together, a pack, we crush bone into fracture, crunch calcium into slop, will you the smiling death, a sudden syndrome, the slow necrosis. Together, the res dogs lick my ducks with tongue sanded into soft leather, nuzzle noses into one another, sleep side by side. This is how a res dog survives in the city. Thank you. It was such a super pleasure to hear you read. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, we have about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, there should be a circulating mic. Zach has it. Uh, just wait for the mic to come to you so that we can have it on the recording. Folks with questions. I'm full of questions, and I'm happy to ask <laughs> you one to get folks started. When, when folks teach your work, or when you imagine your work being taught, are there contexts that are particularly exciting to you to think about uh, both the, the novel and the book of poems being in conversation with other kinds of things and other frames? Yeah, people, I think Full Metal's been, or actually they've both been, I think, been taught quite a bit, but people read Full Metal and they're like, um, okay, but how do I, how does this sound? How do I read this? Yeah. And I'm like, just, just let the oratory guide you yourself, like make a mess of it. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm excited. I think a lot of times Johnny, specifically has been taught with alongside queer theory sometimes full metal too um and for me i always kind of say like sometimes i think theory fails us uh, <laughs> as does english 
<laughs> but specifically theory, if only because it's so laced with jargon. And this is not to say that the non-academic cannot understand them, but a lot of times it's play for the sake of play um, and vanity for the sake of vanity and how many neologisms can I make up um, and how many times can I repeat myself and how many times can I say rhizome? <laughs> not to be targeted. Uh, direct. But so I say theory kind of fails us because if you, I, if I can sit down, like I think decolonial theory, queer theory, um, feminist theory, et cetera, post colonial theory, like they're all handy. We need them. They're like the tools we can use to like dismantle um, structural inequalities. But it doesn't serve the communities we seek to use them for if you can't sit down at a dinner table and have the conversation with your mother or grandmother. Like I can't be like, okay, so. After we eat this like turkey dinner, like let's talk about biopower um, and like how do you think Mbembe would respond to this? <laughs> um, but we need those concepts. So I think yeah. for me, I'm excited with these texts and the new one I'm working on is because I think my role, and I think many of our roles as producers or creators or artists in any way is to take the the concepts of theory and what we have read and experienced, and then to kind of channel it into narrative. Um, so I think Johnny himself is a theorist as much as my grandmother is a theorist as well. Um, like, and I think that's the power of, of stories itself and oratories is like they become fundamental weapons for and sell selves for change and healing. Uh, it's just to, to recognize it just because it doesn't have the stamp of approval from a publisher or from academia doesn't, doesn't make lived experience as much or yeah, oral history is even a type of theory, right? So I think, yeah, I'm excited to see how these enter spaces and how they, Johnny becomes a theorist himself, I suppose, in some ways. I love that answer, <laughs> thank you. Folks with questions. Great. It's helpful that the first question was about Johnny and theory, because I was actually assigned this book uh, in, in a course that I did at the University of Toronto on love and desire in time of crisis. And it was assigned by Dana Seitler, alongside a lot of queer theories. Uh, and I think that there's, a, there's an interesting gap in, in that Johnny is a very sexual book. It, 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 it languishes in the moments of, of ejaculation. There's a lot of very sort of vivid descriptions. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about because, you know, those sorts of vivid descriptions are often missing from queer theory. What a focus on. The, the moment of sex really does for Johnny, specifically with respect to something like survival uh, and, and healing because sex is often looked at as not only Johnny's means of sort of making his way through Winnipeg, but also it's a curative thing in the end, mm -hmm. sex and healing. I'm just gonna see if I can get this up. Yeah, when I was writing Johnny, I was originally writing as young adult fiction. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I felt like we needed to have sex positive um, depictions for sex positivity in indigenous communities. Uh, so it was written in that vein. I was writing it in the wake of, so folks know, Raziel Reed, uh, who won a governor general for children's fiction with uh, queer text that had depictions of queer sex and swearing and drug use in it. Um, so it's called When Everything Feels Like the Movies. They published, Arsenal Paul published um, Reed's novel before mine. I was like, this is the perfect fit. Johnny's gonna do so well here. And then I pitched them this, and like, we love it. But I don't think it works as YA. It's, I was like, it's a little rated R, I suppose, in some ways. Um, but again, for me, I was like, I don't, I, so I, they had to say it's a novel on the front. And I was like, okay, well, it's a novel. Um, but I wanted to keep like the type design and everything and the short kind of vignettes very much in line with young adults because I think for me, with depictions of sex and sexuality, uh, and specifically queer sex and bodily fluids, was to like normalize them and to remove the stigma, um, f primarily from within indigenous community, queer indigenous communities, but indigenous communities too, um, to have positive, healthy representations of sex acts um, between consensual consenting adults, uh, and also to validate online like. Um, online sex work or cam work is also a type of income as well. So again, thinking about like sex work and sexuality uh, and the acts of sex and the messiness of sex to kind of bring those to the, put those on the metaphorical dinner table. I know it's a lot of dinner tables today. Um, to put them on the dinner table so that there was like, there was mirroring or representation for those youth um, and to not shy away from them. Like a lot of times, again, thinking, keeping this in mind, I wanted to be YA, queer sex in YA is often, uh, I, would guess, I guess I would say, 
subsumed or cleaned, I suppose, in a sense, where they can have these depictions. But then again, in heterosexual depictions of YA literature, you can, ha- or in dystopian literature, you can have like beheadings, uh, you can have crazy violent acts, or you can have like vivid depictions of heterosexual sex. Uh, so I was like, okay, whatever, I'm going to do it my way. Um, so even though it was published as a novel for adults, I guess, whatever that means. Uh, I still wanted to keep the t- keep the very much the aesthetic of Johnny for and for the youth to con- to have these conversations, but also to normalize the fact that, or not normalize, but to uh, interrogate the fact that what we now consider queer within indigenous ways of being, at least with my nation, was always kind of a was a normalcy. Like we never had words for queer; we just had terms and technol or terms and identities that identified our role within community, which we may call now call two spirit. But it was just to kind of yeah think about a contemporary sense, a decolonized sense, and perhaps a panging for a pre-colonial sense as well. And for me, the best way that I could do that was to be frank um, and to be explicit and unabashed about acts of sex between queer consenting adults and sometimes teenagers in here. (laughs) And also, yeah, to think about like, this idea of like childhood innocence and like we kids we should know this but like kids have snapchat kids have google like kids know about sex was to also think about removing this idea of innocence from childhood which is always so coded in whiteness um and like suburbia and kids age zero to 18 and then you become an adult then you can drive and drink or do whatever you want buy cigarettes but like indigenous youth and i would say racialized youth and queer youth age in very different registers so again thinking about yeah i also wanted to have depictions of sex between consenting teenagers as well to also spark that conversation, I guess I would say. I hope the class went well too. (laughs) Other folks with questions? That was so delicious. Um, I think, Mm, what I want to ask is is about water, which is my least favorite word to pronounce um, in this country <laughs> with my accent. Um, it's an extremely common word as well. Um, but uh, there was something, uh, images recurring throughout your, th- your readings of, of, of sort of asymmetric mutuality, which um, I... I uh, I'm sort of interested in the wateriness of of uh, labor, of sex, um, the way you referred to water as a, a feral child, someone sort of co-active. Um, and I wondered if you think of whether that is a, a link I made correctly for you is, is um, you know, bath time with your, sorry, not you, Johnny. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> <No> um, <laughs> Johnny's mother um bathing him um seemed uh i don't know i've i've been have been having conversations with 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 friends about this kind of uh queer queerness of maternity uh sodomitical maternity which uh, is not maggie nelson's invention i was mistaken about that she took it from who's susan freeman yeah um and whether so okay this is a very getting very like uh hairy as a question but um i i wonder if uh you could speak to the romanticization of water um and maybe develop a little bit more what i heard you saying about water as something quite dangerous that humbles us you know you talked about humility how how to have humility towards something that is already kind of um um it's both in you and overpowering you um, I think sometimes misunderstandings of the kind of uh, the, the standing rock mobilization with this phrase "water is life," as, which is only one possible translation, as I understand it, of the of the kind of slogan, um, d- misses the sort of the duality. The the the, the midwives at Standing Rock were saying, you know, uh, water is our first medicine, but I mean that doesn't mean medicine it has a dual force. It can, it can it's sort of poison and cure. Um, and something about the translucence of Johnny's lover, like you can almost see all his organs, um, reminded me of the crawfish and being kind of ripped into and and crunched into by kin. There's a sort of violence as w- inside the care that I that that you're depicting. Okay, I um yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about water, please? Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, I think for me, water is the most fundamental element in my life, I guess I would say. Um, so like a quick primer um, in Nehiohuin or Cree. So we don't have genders in, my lang- in our language, but we have animations. Uh, and when we animate something, like we would animate trees, we wouldn't animate a table, although we would, we would have animated the tree that made the table. Um, but when we, when we animate things, we are held accountable to them, they become kin. So we would animate each other, we would animate trees, those would be animate beings, rocks, grandfather rocks for ceremonies, the sky, and the water. Um, and for me, I just like growing up in Winnipeg, um, I know there's another Winnipegger here too. Um, <laughs> growing up in Winnipeg, like the Red River is like, it's always fundamentally there. Um, and it's this murky, dark river you can't really see through it there's like these huge catfish in there that terrify me uh because yeah they're they're so slimy and sometimes they slap your legs if you're in the water um anywho but it's also a fundamental part to like recreation in winnipeg as well and it sits along the forks in winnipeg which is kind of the meeting space of various intertribal indigenous nations as well and the birthing place of post-contact nations meaning birth like nations birth after colonization so the metis the og cree which is what i'm from which is a joining of anishinaabe and cree folks so like sex and water become ways of like procuring futures in that sense but also a linkage to the past as well like the 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 forks themselves and the red river that sits on them are like fundamental parts of trade networks kinship systems um and tribal meeting spaces as well between sovereign nations so water is always fundamental to me but water specifically in winnipeg has a very tumultuous experience with missing and murdered indigenous women girls and two-spirited folks um if you've heard of tina fontaine her body was drugged from there katarina vermette another indigenous writer um from winnipeg as well has this documentary dragging the red so it's like this is we're always kind of in constant awe and fear i think as indigenous peoples of the red river so I wanted to kind of play with water because, again, as Johnny narrated, the word Manitoba comes from the Cree Manitoba, which means the Strait of the Spirit. Um, so it's, again, the forks coming together, right? And Winnipeg is also the birth space of the pan-Indigenous English term Two-Spirit in 1990. So, and it's a post-contact space. So again, like sex and water and fluidity always come into play, be them a Two-Spirit identity, be them the forks themselves with the Red River, or be it the space, uh, a river that eats children, as Johnny narrates, right? A river that kind of consumes Indigenous peoples by the perpetrators of missing and murdered Indigenous women. So I wanted to kind of play with that. And and I was saying water is a fundamental element to me. I wanted to write, how could I write like water? Um, And in doing that, I just kind of turned to Indigenous oratories, um, which never tell, time is a circular concept rather than a linear one. And we never tell stories um, in straight time. It's always like, to tell you this story, I have to tell you eight other stories. And it's like, it becomes a whole day adventure. so I wanted to kind of write like I knew and how could I make an aesthetics of water or a sound of water in prose form was for me to kind of allow that fluidity um, and then allow the fluidity maybe to like come on the page too, to use both terms of the verb. <laughs> Hello. So like Jonathan, I also read your book in a class in the fall, um, specifically talking about um, kind of what to do with the erasure of like the queerness of children in that it exists and sort of looking at it in a lot of different realms. So I've looked at like sort of children's literature from like George to distinctly Wyatt. Um, But my question was just kind of you're writing in these kind of very different registers. So like Johnny Appleseed like presents very different, differently from your book of poetry. And I know you're now writing in creative nonfiction and just kind of curious about what kind of guides that change. Like, is that like a very conscious decision about like what kind of audience is this going to get to and how is this going to be disseminated? Or is that much more moved by, I want to write about this and this is the way that it makes sense to write about it. Yeah. Uh, I would say it's a fusion. Um, one, I do try to keep the contemporary politics um, of indigenous youth primarily in mind when I'm writing. But at the same time, I have always kind of said like writing saves me from myself. 
Um, so uh, I call my stories like when Johnny was published after Full Metal almost immediately. I would not advise doing that. That was so much touring while doing a PhD. Um, so I wrote Full Metal. Uh, so the character is uh, this cybernetic trickster named Zoa, who's kind of like uh, this online handle, um, this kind of virus trickster. Uh, so I finished that. And then when I was, I had originally had these like beach poems in Full Metal. Uh, so they're the beach poems that are the beach scenes from Johnny, but they're like these evocative kind of more human, human based or humanistic scenes of like, yeah, the sensuality of touch, I suppose I would say the politics and ethics of touch. Um, but my, my editor was Jordan Abel and Nishka poet in Canada was like, these don't fit. This is like highly, like, this is like cyberpunk, biopunk, but then there's like these beach poems, like they just don't make sense. Um, and so Jordan had me cut them out and I was sad to have to like kill my darlings, but as we do in creative writing. Uh, but I didn't want to get rid of them, so I kept them. Um, and then I was joining this class, this writing class called 100 Pages in 100 Days, and I was like, oh my God, I got to slap together a quick proposal. Um, so I took the beach scenes out, but Johnny's a character that's like always lived, like lived with me for like well over a decade, just like in the back of my mind. So I had these beach pe these beach poems, these highly sensual poems, um, and then I was like, well, let me try this character, Johnny. And so Johnny began as a short story based on the um, remnants, I suppose, or the wreckage, what was cut from the wreckage of Full Metal. Johnny became the short little short story. Uh, and then I continued working on the novel, and then I did a residency and finished it, completed it from a novella into a novel. So Johnny was like a short story, a novella, novel. But very much kind of came from, yeah, I would say like the, the, the remnants of Full Metal. Uh, so I call them sibling stories because I kind of think of Johnny as like the human counterpart to the avatar that is Zoa from the first book. Um, and they, they speak to each other in ways. There are kind of um, similarities between the both. Um, so with this new book, that in this book of creative nonfiction, which is about indigeneity, queerness, and mental health, uh, very much kind of comes from Johnny again in that there's, there's no excised bits that led into this. But there's a line in Johnny where his Kukumar's grandmother teaches him, and we heard the beginning of it in the, the water scene, where Johnny's saying, uh, how can I be humble myself to water if I'm so humiliated by it? And then towards the end of the novel, Johnny's Kukum teaches him that humiliation is just a, or sorry, humility is just a humiliation you love so much it transformed. So I wanted to kind of think of like, if we kind of think of the negative affects or pain or mental health, if we animate them in a Cree sense, make them kin, something we live with, rather than something that's like taboo or um, stigmatized or something to avoid, how can we transform, use that type of, um, use that type of rhetoric, I suppose, or that pedagogy to enact that in the real world sense. Like if we make love to our pain, does it transform from a humiliation into a humility? Or how can we treat, say, anxiety or depression or insomnia as kin? How can we make, make love to those and how do those transform? Uh, and how do, how do we house the, these other perhaps entities or kin within us in ways that are ethical and perhaps allow us both to kind of blossom? And the one resolution I've come to so far is with insomnia, when I, I do these writing workshops a lot, and I'm always like, the one thing I learned from Johnny while working on this new book is to sleep with your characters. And everyone's like, what? I was like, <clears throat> when having insomnia, when I was writing Johnny, what I would do is because I couldn't sleep, I would just continually world craft or world build and um, character craft in my head so much to the point that I like knew what Johnny smelled like. I knew his favorite foods. Uh, I knew what kind of music he liked, how we liked to dress. I just n intimately knew the body uh, and character of Johnny um, so that when I was couldn't fall asleep, I would just like enact or like to perhaps animate Johnny in my head, um, like an avatar too almost, and then would fall asleep and would just kind of have these like very vivid, sometimes sex dreams with my own character. Um, so I w that was like one way for me to kind of see the positivity of something what we might deem negative, like insomnia, to change it from a humiliation into a humility, whereas insomnia, yes, delimits my sleep, but also allows me access to creativity in some senses. So they're all, they're all kind of, they are interconnected, like they're all kind of siblings. The third one's going to be like the triplet of the three, I guess. <laughs> it's probably time for one more question. Sure. 
Hi, I'm not an academic, so, but I graduated from Penn 30 years ago, and I wanted to tell you all how wonderful this place is, and also the LGBT Center, because none, well, I won't go into history, but my question for you really is, uh, reading a lot of American fiction, when I see your book and see, like, it's one of 25 finalists, I'm like, why does no Canadian, or very little Canadian fiction come to America? I almost feel like it's a fiction in translation, because remember... I'm in Canada and I go in the bookstore, it's like, these all look wonderful, why haven't, you know, and I think, and I did want to congratulate you on winning the Lambda Prize last year, right? So, yeah. Uh, which is, yeah, so I think that probably didn't hurt your book in getting over here either, but, uh, but still, I just, you know, I feel bad because it feels like you guys are almost unheard of a lot of the time. I think there's this understanding by Americans that Canadians just write about the idyll of the prairies, which we used to do a lot, but it's very much changed. There's more than just romantic pasture now. <laughs> or, and we've moved past lower angles. Um, but I would say, I would say like it's the publishing industry too that delimits the access to the U.S. or internationally. Uh, so I'm lucky like Arsenal Pulp, who published this, um, has access to U.S. Um, distribution as well. But there's a lot of smaller indie presses that just don't have that type of labor or um, capital to do that. So I'd say like that's one hindrance. Um, and two, that we have conglomerates like Penguin Canada and Knopf, who I'm working with now, who have like this kind of control the market, right? Um, so the Canadian books say like, they just become so infused, I would say, between the, t the two borders that it's kind of hard to sometimes to distinguish. Like I'm thinking of like, and I, I'd say this is more, probably more prominent for queer and racialized writers or indigenous writers, but like Tommy Orange or Therese Marie Mayo, um, whose book Heartberry is like, there, it kind of exists simultaneously between both spaces that it's sometimes hard to distinguish that one's a Canadian and one's an American, right? Or, um, so I would say it's those two. And then just like the, I would say, this is something I've noticed, like when doing readings and workshops in America that in the US, that yeah, it was like, oh, I just thought this was gonna be like kind of flower poetry or <laughs> talking about rivers. I was like, well, I do talk about rivers, but it's very sexy. <laughs> but I would say the state of Canadian literature right now, um, at least, so the state of indigenous literature within the kind of critical nation state of Canlit is very much like on the rise, blossoming, flourishing right now. So we have folks like um, oh, they're all gonna sleep. Billy Ray Belcourt, Gwen Benaway, um, I can't think of Eden Robinson right now, Katarina Vermette, who I mentioned earlier. I would say the state of Canadian literature is vastly and quickly changing. That I think, and publishers such as the conglomerates like Penguin um, are picking up these texts. So like I, I'm hopeful. So those are some of the hindrances, but I do think that what we consider queer liter queer Canadian literature, indigenous literature in Canada, um, or any type of other BIPOC writing within Canada is being picked up by these larger houses and hopefully will be entering the marketplace, um, of like American literature at the same time. But it's just taken so long because those who have been in positions of power, primarily like white, heterosexual, cisgendered men, have controlled that marketplace for so long, but we're slowly, at least in Canada, wrenching it out of their hands. And it's very very much become a vastly changed literary landscape um, that I'm excited to see what it's gonna look like between the borders of US and Canada within the next like five, 10 years. So stay tuned, I guess. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Joshua Whitehead. There's more lunch, there's books for sale in the other room. Please come and say hi to Joshua. I'll be here. That was so that was such a pleasure to